I feel a bit like a South African politician starting with a quote at the beginning of a speech. But here goes the quote. Everyone is waiting for some blunder down the road and these blunders have already been made. The blunders have already been built into the system. You can see this collapse coming a mile away. This is The Moneymakers. I'm Bruce Whitfield and tonight via Skype I'm joined by the man who said those words, best-selling author, chief global strategist at West Shore Funds, Dr. Jim Rickard, who joins us about how leading monetary authorities and policymakers have missed a clear crisis as warning signs and are holding too bullish a view on growth. Jim Rickard, it's nice to have you uh, on The Money Makers this evening. You're due in South Africa fairly soon to speak at one of our universities. Are you bracing yourself to be, uh, to be swamped? Well, I'm looking forward to it. I've been, I was in uh, Cape Town last year and this will be my first visit to uh, Johannesburg. Uh, it's a beautiful country, great people. I'm looking forward to coming back and looking forward to uh, the event. Our group is the uh, CFA Society, and as you know, a uh, very high-level group in terms of their training and understanding. So I enjoy that because it, it gives, as a speaker, gives me the opportunity to be a little more technical when you have a technical audience. So it's a good subject. Looking forward to the visit. Well, if you can avoid the technicalities this evening and keep it uh, for the layman that is me, um, I'd appreciate it. Give, sure. give me a sense, please, of your perspective on the crisis that is already unfolding. Is it all to do with the, a lack of confidence in central banks and central banks? Bankers? Well, I think that's where it ends up, Bruce. So when I told you know my my most recent book, it's called The Death of Money, and people say, well, that sounds fairly ominous. What do you mean by that? But what I mean is really a collapse or a loss of confidence in central banking in paper money. In effect, it's happened on numerous occasions in the past. It's not that rare. It happens every 30 or 40 years. Uh, we saw it in 1914. We saw it again in 1939. Again in 1971. So that's really what I see coming. But um, when you look at the hit, when you look at central banking, even in, in recent decades, uh, our own central bank, the um, U.S. Federal Reserve, uh, they missed the Mexican crisis in 1994, did not see it coming. 1998, the emerging markets crisis. Nine, uh, 2000, our dot-com bubble. 2007, the mortgage crisis. Again and again, they miss bubbles, they miss crises, they don't see it coming, they have an inadequate or, uh, or an incompetent but in some ways response. So all I'm doing as an analyst is looking at the signs, looking at concentration of assets in the banking system, looking at derivatives, leverage, and seeing the same thing happening again. Uh, how is it playing out? Because one looks toward the central banks and um, the world and markets certainly hang on the utterances and the interpretations of the utterances of Janet Yellen and the U.S. Fed. And every time there is any kind of statement from the U.S. Uh, US Fed, the markets hold their breath, make an interpretation and pick a direction from that point. Well, that's exactly right, Bruce. I mean, you described it perfectly. But think of, uh, think of what a, a poor system that is. Why are the smartest people in the world, at least in those in finance, racking their brains day and night trying to decide what side of the bed Janet Yellen gets out of in the morning? I mean, people should be going about their business. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, banks should be facilitating commerce, not an end in itself. We should have a more normal economy. Instead, we're spending all our time worrying about, as you said, the other instances or the musings of one central banker. That shows how the system has, uh, has been manipulated and concentrated in the hands of central bank, which is not healthy at all. Typically, how have the previous crises of confidence in paper money played out? You talk about 1914, 1939, and I think you mentioned 1971. Uh, if we're going through that process right now, what does history tell us about what happens? Well, what's interesting, and I, and I said this in my first book, Currency Wars, is that some of the episodes are highly inflationary. We've certainly seen uh, what happened with the Weimar Republic in 1922, what happened in the United States in the late 70s. From 1977 to 1981, the United States had 50% inflation, 5-0, in a five-year period. That wasn't looking over some, you know, 100-year time frame. Other episodes, such as the 1930s, have been deflationary. So the, the problem today, if I told you we were definitely going to have inflation, you know, an investor would know what to do, you know, buy some gold, buy some hard assets. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, you would also know what to do. You'd have more cash and you'd have bonds. Those are assets that do well in deflation. But what if I said we're on the knife edge? It could tip either way, depending on the, the blunders, as I put it, of the central banks. That's the situation we're in. So it's a very difficult environment for investors. It's why you see the kind of volatility. I call it non-directional volatility. You know, our own stock market will be up 2% one day, down 2% the next day, and then back up again. Uh, what is that other than guessing about what the Fed is going to do next? Uh, but, you know, right now, they, uh, you know, they, the former chairman of the Fed, Ben Bernanke, did a few interviews in recent days. He has a book coming out, so of course he's 
he's you know promoting his book, which is fine as an author. I'm all uh, I'm all for that. But uh, he said there's no bubble in U.S. housing. Well, that's correct. It probably is not a bubble in U.S. housing, but there is a bubble in emerging markets dollars denominated debt, in oil or energy related dollars denominated debt, in U.S. commercial real estate, in U.S. stocks. And the bubbles are all around us. They just can't see them. What is it about central bankers that makes them blind to the bubbles? No, quite a few of them. I've met members of the Board of Governors. I've met our regional reserve bank presidents. I worked uh, in uh, long-term capital management. I was the general counsel there. I negotiated the bailout of that hedge fund in 1998. We had 16 finance PhDs from top schools like MIT. So there's, there's no lack of IQ points. They're, they're brilliant people. By and large, they're nice people. And they're well-intentioned. I don't think there's any evil conspiracy. The problem is they have obsolete models. Their models are not a reflection of reality. If, I'm, if I hold this pen and I say, if I let go of my model, is that the pen is going to float to the ceiling. Well, if I'm on the planet Earth, that's a bad model. Actually, the pen's going to fall to the desk. And so if you have the if you have wrong or obsolete models, you'll get wrong forecasts and wrong policies every time. And that, that's what I'm going to be talking about in South Africa. What what's wrong with central banking models and then what models do work that will give you better results in terms of forecasting. And that's that's, you know, it's a paradigm shift in economic thinking. But these things, uh, they take time to, to sort of uh, permeate, if you will, the uh, academia and uh, the training these folks have had. So, the, so they're not um, they're not evil, but they do have obsolete models. So give, give us a, a foretaste then of the talk that you're giving in South Africa, the sort of perspective that you would like to see the central banks and policymakers carrying forward if the models are obsolete. What models should they be looking at? Well, they use uh, what they call equilibrium models, and the idea is that you know the economy is like a, a finely made Swiss watch. So if it gets a little bit out of sync one way, you you apply policy and bring it back, and it goes too far the other way, you can apply policy and bring it back. So through tightening or easing of the money supply, you can uh, sort of amplify or damp down behavior in the economy. It's a very simple equilibrium model. The problem is that economies and societies and human behavior are complex systems. They're not equilibrium systems. So in the short run, they they can behave a little bit like an equilibrium system, but they're prone to very sudden changes in uh, behavior uh, psychology. Uh, it's sort of like putting a pot of water on a stove and, and turning up the heat. Well, for a while, nothing happens. It's just water, but then suddenly the pot will turn to steam and the water will evaporate. So it's very much like that. And uh, so in complex systems, there's adaptability, interaction, communication. These are all the characteristics. But the point is, it's, uh, you know, everyone's sitting in the theater and everyone's calm and then all of a sudden one person yells fire and everyone runs out and there's a panic at the door. That's the way markets operate. That's not an equilibrium system. That's a system that is subject to sudden, spontaneous um, changes, what we call phase transitions in behavior. Well, that's how panics begin. That's how contagion spreads. That's how bubbles form. That's how bubbles pop. And unless you put that into your risk models, you're going to keep having bubbles. I mean, just uh, six weeks ago, when uh, the Chinese shouted fire with the devaluation of the yuan, okay. you know, you know better than most, of course, about currency wars. It was the title of your previous book. Give me a perspective as how to as to how this plays out. We've seen a drop off in exports out of the United States, courtesy of a too stronger dollar. We've seen depreciation of the euro. We've seen de depreciation of the yuan in recent weeks. Give me a perspective, please, on global currencies, especially as a particularly vulnerable uh, foreign currency market. In South Africa uh, goes. Sure, and I was, uh, you know, my last visit to South Africa, I, the, the rand had gone from, uh, you know, kind of eight to the dollar, and then all the way down to about twelve, a little over eleven to the dollar, and then back towards eight. Not based on any change in policy by the uh, South African Central Bank or anything in particular related to the South African in economy, but particularly, but but specifically because of shifts in Federal Reserve policy. So this is having repercussions all over the world. But the basics, there's a slowdown in the world. There's strong deflationary trends. Uh, basically what happened is the Fed, the, our Federal Reserve began tightening two and a half years ago in May 2013. And when I say they've been tightening, people are shocked to hear me say that. They go, what do you mean tightening? Their interest rates have been zero for seven years. How could they be tightening? But they're tightening through words and actions. Uh, May 2013, Ben Bernanke, just suggested suggested that they were the Fed was going to reduce asset purchases. That was the taper talk. There was a, there were immediate outflows of capital from emerging markets. South Africa um, suffered through that, as did other countries. Then in November, uh, December 2013, they started actually tapering. That is reducing 
their money printing operation. November 2014, they finished the taper. March 2015, they removed what they call forward guidance. They had been telling the markets, hey, don't worry, we're not going to raise rates anytime soon. There was the famous word patient. Well, they removed the word patient from their statement. That shows how ridiculous this is, Bruce. We're talking about one, you know, two syllable word coming out. Yep. All of a sudden, the world has changed. But, but it changes expectations. I mean, there is a market reaction to all these things. And then since then, they've been talking tough about raising interest rates. The problem is all this tough talk has led people to think interest rates are going up, has caused the dollar to get stronger, has made the U.S. a magnet for deflation from all over the world, has caused capital outflows from other markets. China suffered because China pegged their currency to the dollar. So we had a stronger dollar. That meant they had to have a stronger yuan. Well, their economy was slowing down. So they were tightening policy in a slowing environment, which is ridiculous. That's nonsense. So they eventually threw in the towel and broke the peg and cheapened their currency relative to the dollar. My expectation is that we'll do that again. But this is all based on a bad forecast. The Fed thought that the U.S. economy was strong enough to bear a strong dollar. That was a bad forecast. They got a bad policy, which was tightening. Uh, and now the whole world is slowing down. My expectation is they're going to have to ease. I think the next move will be towards easing, probably by reinstating some kind of forward guidance. So they're, they're tightening and easing through the selection of words, not by raising rates, because they're stuck at the zero bound. But it still has real world implications. The dollar actually does get stronger. And if they ease, the dollar will get weaker. And then that could actually cause capital to flow back to the emerging markets. But again, this is all, uh, there's far too much power, far too much attention to the central bank. It's unfortunate, but it's the way the world is. One has to deal with it. Jim Ricardo, thank you so much for joining us this evening on The Money Makers, the chief global strategist at West Shore Funds, the editor of Strategic Intelligence, the author of uh, books including Currency Wars. My thanks to you for joining us, Jim Ricardo, and also thanks to you for watching. There'll be more positivity and maybe some doom and gloom and maybe some volatility, uncertainty, and certainly the interventions of a central bank. <laughs> Next time on The Money Makers with me, Bruce Whitfield. Thanks for watching. Good night.